So let's say you studied CS and you coded something cool. Like maybe you made an AI OnlyFans. Uh -huh. It runs on your computer, but it doesn't run on anyone else's computer, so it's not that useful. Hmm, so how can you code so that other people can use what you make? And also, how can you make money doing that? Yeah, these are the topics that we're going to be talking about. And oh, I just launched my startup, Pair AI, an open source code editor that will completely change the way you code. Alright, it's time to learn. Pretty much this video is what I wish was taught to me in college, so let's head right in. So first, this concept of turning your code into a service that other people can use is called SaaS, or Software as a Service. This means that people don't have to download anything or use any app. They can just use your code through the internet. And this code runs on the cloud, which we're going to get to later. The first thing we have to do is turn our code into an API, or an application programming interface. We talk a lot about this on the channel, but pretty much in a restaurant, if your code is the kitchen and the chef, this API layer Wear is like hands. the waiter. When you eat at a restaurant, you can't just go directly and talk to the chefs because they're focused on cooking the food, so you make orders through the waiter. This API layer is like a wrapper around your code so that it will have endpoints that people can access through the internet. In our code, how we can do this is with an API framework. For Python, there's a lot, but I would recommend Fast API. Oh, and I guess just a note, throughout this video, I'm gonna be recommending frameworks or services. While coding Pair AI, I realized like the entire development space is pretty unstructured. So I'll just try to save you guys some time and just give you guys recommendations on what we did for Pair AI. I'm not sponsored. I'm also still unemployed. This is getting bad. Okay, then if you have users, you probably need authentication in your service. This is the whole sign in, sign up, user account stuff. The most modern type of authentication on the web is done with something called JWTs or JSON Web Tokens. This is how it works. When a user signs in, your code will take the user's information and encode it into what looks like a bunch of random characters. This is called the token and it's also encoded with a password so nobody can edit this token. Your code will give this token back to the user that signed in and they'll keep it on their web browser. You probably have seen this before, this information that's stored on the web browser are called cookies. Then every request that comes from the user to our code has its JWT attached to it, and if the JWT is valid, then we know that the user is signed in and authenticated. You could code this yourself, but that shit just takes way too long. I would recommend using a service like Auth0 or Supabase. Okay, then if you have users, you probably need to store data about them. And for this, you need a database. There's two main types, SQL and no SQL. SQL just means that it's structured data, so it has rows and columns, kind of like an Excel sheet. And no SQL means that it's unstructured or semi-structured data, kind of like Google Docs. Both are fine, they both work, but I would recommend if you're starting out on a project, I would use no SQL because you can make changes to the database schema as you just go. All right, then if your service has a lot of users, you probably want observability. What this means is that you set up dashboards and monitors so you can see what's going on with your code. If you don't have this set up, then when something goes wrong, you have to look at a single console log that combines pretty much everybody that's using your code's requests all together. And yeah, it's gonna be terrible. So to get observability in your code, you need to add logging to open source frameworks like OpenTelemetry. And yeah, stuff like this is free. And then let's say something's going wrong with user A, then you can look at every step of user A's problematic request to see what went wrong. You can also just visualize what's going on with your code a lot better. Like you can see how many requests per month you're getting. For the dashboards and monitoring, I would recommend something like Grafana or Axiom. Ah oh, shit, what a grind. So this next part is something called CICD or continuous integration and continuous deployment. To make sure you can keep making changes and improvements to your code without pretty much breaking everything, you probably want to set this up. Continuous integration just means that every time you push code to your repository, your code will automatically run all the tests and make sure that nothing's breaking. And then continuous deployment is that every change that you make that passes these tests gets automatically rolled out so that users can see the most updated version of your code. For this, it's pretty standard. You just use GitHub Actions to do this all automatically. And also it's gonna be a setting in your cloud deployment. Okay, and when you have all that set up, you wanna run your code on the cloud. Basically, you can run your code on your computer, but it would have to be running 24 seven. And if you get too many users, then your computer is just gonna be beyond cooked. 
So deploying your code on the cloud just means that you pay a big company to run your code on one of their giant computers like in the middle of the Arctic or something. And that computer is running 24 seven so people can use it. The big companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft all offer these services and I've used them before. But for Pear AI, we use DigitalOcean, a newer company, and it's actually just goaded. I highly recommend it. Okay, and now people can actually use your code. I would say on the internet, if you can make something that solves people's problems that they're willing to pay for, then you can make money. Oh, I forgot to mention, but for processing payments, I would just recommend Stripe. I really couldn't find any other competitors, so yeah, I would say just use Stripe. If you want to learn more about anything I talked about in this video, I would say probably just search it up on the internet. This video was meant to be more of a starting point for you to learn stuff. And I would say the best way to actually learn about this stuff is just to make your own projects. I would say that you would learn a lot more than you can learn on the internet by just doing it yourself. And when you do that, you should use Pear AI. My co-founder Frying Pan and I just launched Pear AI to the public and we've gotten just a ton of good reviews. I would say that I'm extremely proud of it. Like it helps me an insane amount when I'm coding. All right, a quick bit about this, but Pear AI integrates AI into your code editor. You can ask Pear AI to help you code. Like for the API part, you can just ask Pear AI to code that for you and yeah, it'll do it. And if you're trying to learn more, you can just ask Pear AI and yeah, it'll tell you everything you need to know and more. And the last thing is, is that Pear AI has knowledge of your code base. It's done with something called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. But pretty much if you're opening a new code base or your code base grows, then Pear AI has specific knowledge on your code base to give you better, actually relevant suggestions. It's also open source, which means the code is fully open to the public and transparent. And yeah, if you want to contribute to making the best, most innovative code editor the world has ever seen, then yeah, you can do that too. All right, go check it out. You can download and use it for free at tripair.ai now. And that's about it. Peace.